Hello, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number four, Ontologies as Key to Knowledge Representation. Let's unlock the potential of OWL. We are still here in the modeling level of the Semantic Web Technology stack and this is OWL. Okay, next thing we are going to introduce are property relationships. You know already about property hierarchies. We have already introduced this with RDFS. RDFS subproperty, you know already, it does not introduce any new semantics and does not hurt OWL2, so therefore we are simply reusing it to declare subproperties here. And then we also have inverse properties to define something to be uh, a property to be the inverse, the opposite of an already existing property, or we can also say a property is equivalent, so it's exactly the same like another property. Why do we have to do that? You might remember that we have the open world assumption and this means we have explicitly state the equivalence or the difference of things here because we cannot deduce it automatically. It has to be stated explicitly because we are living in an open world. Let's have a look at the examples. <coughs> we have here made of as an object property and this is defined to be a sub property of consists of. So as easy as that with RDFS sub property. If we have, for example, the property read, this is the inverse of is read by, so I simply turn it around. And the OWL keyword I'm using here is OWL inverse of. And for declaring the equivalency of two things, I'm using here OWL equivalent property, and I simply declare here that the property composed of is the equivalent property to consists of. These are the simple property relationship. Besides that, I can also declare more complex relationships. First of all, transitivity. So declare, to declare a property to be transitive, I'm using the keyword OWL transitive property. We all know transitivity. If I say if A is part of B and B is part of C, then it holds that also A is part of C. I can declare a property to be symmetric. What's symmetric? If a is neighbor of B, then of course also B is neighbor of A. And I declare this via OWL symmetric property. Next thing would be functionality. I can declare a functional property. For example, if I say if A, uh, if A has mother B, so B is the mother of A, and then if I say C is the mother of A, simply because has mother is a functional property, it only holds or it must be that B and C are identical. So A cannot be simply mapped to two different values because it's functional, like a mathematical function. So therefore it holds then that B equals C and this is done by our OWL functional property. And of course I can also turn it around. Then I have inverse functional property. So the other way would be then I have a relation is mother of, so B is mother of A and C is mother of A, and inverse functionality would simply mean B and C then must be the same. Okay, let's have a look at a specific example, first starting with transitive properties. I have chosen here the example of published before or is published before, so that's an object property and I declare it to be a transitive property on the domain and range of books. So it's about books and one book can be published before another book. I now declare that Animal Farm, it's a book and it's published before 1984. And then I declare Brave New World, also a book that has been published before Animal Farm. So you might notice here the famous books from George Orwell or Aldous Huxley. Now, since published before is transitive, I can automatically, via inference, entail that Brave New World has also been published before 1984. So that goes quickly and we come to further property relationships that we might express in OWL. First of all, for the symmetric properties, we can also define properties to be asymmetric. What's an asymmetric property? So we remember symmetric was neighbor relation. So there it didn't matter whether we exchange, you know, the two things that were connected with it. But if I define to be something left of something or to be right of something, then I cannot simply turn it around. So if A is left of B, 
then it's not possible that B is left of A2. So that's not possible. I can declare this to be asymmetric, and that would be the OWL asymmetric property keyword that I'm using to do that. Another thing would be I can declare a property to be reflexive, which means I will also uh, I, I always allow that, of course, um, an individual is related to itself. And this is always the case for reflexive properties. For example, is related to, there is always then for every property also, or for every individual, the relation that the individual is related to itself. And this, of course, I express then with our <coughs> reflexive property. Of course, I can also um, force the opposite and then use an irreflexive property restriction. So this means, for example, I have a property where you know an individual cannot be related with it with itself. So for example, for is parent of, if I say x is parent of y, then it clearly holds that x cannot be identical with y. So that cannot be, I cannot be parent of my own. So that doesn't work. And I declare this simply to be an owl irreflexive property. And by that, I can exclude many more semantic exp expressivity into my property definitions, which is important to express things and also then to declare complex classes and expressions for that. Furthermore, I can declare two properties to be disjunctive, meaning that if two individuals, x and y, are there, and they are never related via both properties at the same time. Like, for example, the two properties has parent and has child. If I have somebody who is my parent, then that parent can never be my child. I declare this in the following way. Has parent here is an object property, and then I declare this to be by a property disjoint with that has child, of course, is in that sense disjunctive. Of course, if I would have many properties who are all disjunctive to each other, what I would have to do between each possible pair, I would have to make exactly that kind of definition and you can abbreviate it. So there is a, uh, the possibility to de declare all positives, uh, all properties of a collection to be disjoint with the directive uh, OWL all disjoint properties. So here I define something to be of type OWL all disjoint properties. And I, then I define here a list with members. And then this is a collection. You see here the parentheses. And then I simply enumerate has parent, has child, has grandchild. And these are then all disjoint properties. And I don't have to repeat um, this definition many times. Of course, I save more space the more properties will be disjoint here. Um, talking about disjointness, we also have to talk about negation of a property. But what does that mean? Uh, negation of properties, that's a negative um, property assumption. Two individuals can explicitly be defined not to be related with each other via a given property. Simple example here, so we have George Orwell and Isaac Asimov, and we wanted to note that they are definitely not brothers. As simply, this is what we assume. How do I do that? I declare here a negative property assertion. So that's the new keyword we have here. And then I have to make clear, okay, between exactly which individuals does a specific property not hold. So I have a source individual that would be George Orwell. I have a target individual, Isaac, Isaac Asimov. And then I have here the assertion property, which doesn't hold between the two of that. And this is, for example, is brother. Why is it um, important? Yeah, since we are in an open world, if I don't state it explicitly, it's always possible. And if I want to explicitly exclude it, if this is important for my application, then of course I have also to put in there a negative property instantiation. Going further, let's have a look at property chaining. You might remember that OWL2 um, complies to the description logics SROIC. SROIC contains an R, and this means you can introduce or com can compose roles there. Complex roles are roles that are, you know, composed of other roles. This is the R box. Let's take an example. I can here, for example, define the friends of my friends are also my friends. What I do here is I'm 
simply chain the property has friend and say then simply here if I traverse this chain then also myself here who has the friend who has the friend that I have the friend uh, the same friend however this is simply transitive I can do this without property chaining but if I change one component in here if I say the foes of my friends are also my foes then I can't express it with transitivity anymore. So I have here myself, I have a friend, and of course this friend has a foe, which means this should become also my foe. This can of course be expressed with first order logic and rule axiom. So that would look like the following way. For all individuals x, y and z, it holds that if x has friend y and y has friend z, then X has a friend's foe set. Whoops. So this is exactly what I can do here with first order logic. Uh, this can be transferred also to um, description logics and there we are at the so-called general role inclusion or property chaining. <coughs> I can define a property chain that consists of the two properties has friend and has foe. And I declare a new property has friends foe to indicate that this is a chain um, in the following way. So we have here has friends foe, that's my new property. I declare it to be an object property and I say, yeah, this is based on our property chain axiom, followed by a collection. And then I simply enumerate all of the properties that are listed here, like has friend and has foe. As you might have seen, this is of course restricted to object properties. So it's not allowed for data type properties because it wouldn't make sense if I have here a data type property and here is a value to connect a value then with another property to something. So therefore it's only allowed for object properties. We almost have it. Let's have a look at the rest, what we haven't talked about now. One thing is qualified number restrictions. We have already talked about number restrictions. We can qualify each number restriction then also by adding to the number restriction we have here to uh, a specific class. So we restrict also the results in there that we define to a specific class. So for example, a successful author is somebody who has published more notable works or as a bestseller than just a single one, which means a successful author has published more than one bestseller among his or her notable works. How do I define that? So I define here a class successful author. It's a subclass of a restriction that I define here on the property notable work. And then I have the new keyword minimum qualified cardinality and this I is restrict to one which is of course an integer, non-negative, and I have then to restrict the class and the class is bestseller. So this exactly then makes a successful author. If instead of you know, giving a lower bound, which is then here one, I can also give an upper bound with max qualified cardinality, or I can give an exact bound with qualified cardinality. However, all of them have to include a class here. So that's qualified number restrictions. We almost done it. Now reflexive property restrictions would be also an add-on we have to talk about. If I want to define a philosopher as somebody who knows himself and I want to put this into the class description, this is a reflexive property restriction within the class. Meaning I create here a class called philosophers as a subclass of a restriction on the property knows and then I have a specific keyword that uh, tells me has self which means this of course um, uh, restricts all the members of the class of those who have here a, a self reflexive um, property assertion. So each single philosopher should know himself otherwise he isn't a philosopher. So that's um, even more than simply making a property reflexive because then also property relations hold there. Here we do exactly only those um, for each and single individual exactly this must hold that uh, this individual knows itself. So that's a reflexive property restriction. Let's have a look at data types in the end. So here, um, of course, OWL supports data types like in RDFS. 
data types are here again, identified by a IRI. So the writing, if you have this um, turtle serialization, is exactly the same like you know it. We have here a mapping from lexical space, so everything is here given first the value as a character string, and then we have a value space, and the mapping here after the double head would be XST integer. Also. So we have lexical space and value space. The only thing we have to keep in mind is that not all XML schema data types are supported. So for example, date, time, duration, as well as the Gregorian year, they are not supported because they also comply to a, let's say, more complex semantics if you really want to deal with dates and with time instead of regular numbers. It's not only the format that is looked for or taken care of in XML, you remember XML, it's only a syntactical convention to write well-formed dates, for example, with XSD date. If we really want to make sure that this is also semantically valid date, we would have to include more semantics and therefore they have um, omitted it. It's the same thing like here, we have qualified names, so this is XSD Q name that also has been omitted from the data types for OWL2. One specialty, and this now really is the very last thing I tell you here in that lecture, um, are the so-called facet restrictions. Besides the new old two data types, real and rational, I have the possibility also to use an existing data type and restrict it to um, specific facets. So I restrict the range of the data type. Let's, for example, define what is a minor age. This is a data type and it's equivalent, of course, to a data type restriction on a specific data type here. I restrict here the XSD integer type and I then say OWL with restrictions and I list here as a collection the restrictions I put on it. And what I can do there is I can again give upper and lower bounds and they can inclusive or exclusive. And for a minor age, I would include zero, so it's from birth, and then I would say as soon as you are 18 years old, then of course you are out, you are not minor age anymore. So this is then exclusive 18 of, uh, regarding the age. And then I would have defined what is a minor age as a data type and I could declare things to be of minor age and then I would have this data type which is range restricted from zero to less than 18. So this was a lot of OWL in this week. In the next week, we will talk about ontology engineering to create smarter knowledge graphs.